I've kind of um, split my presentation, my presentation, my workshop up into kind of a show and tell, if you will. And then uh, I figured we can take some time. If you have something you're already working on or you have questions or you want me to demonstrate something, um, we can have that kind of, let's call it a Q&A free for all. <laughs> At the end, does that sound all right to both of you, or would you rather just dive into the the Q and A, or how do you want to use this time? We do have an hour and a half. We don't have to take the whole time. If if you know, uh, two o'clock rolls around and we're we're feeling pretty good, we can leave it there. Um, I'll I'm, leave it up to you. I'm flexible. Uh, whatever you guys like to do. Uh, Holy. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start with your presentation. Sure. And see, you know, which direction we are going, and you know, yeah. we can have, you know, uh, as we move, we can continuously have a question answer session so that perfect we can cover both, you know, because you, you spent a lot of time in creating this presentation. So we I need did. to really, at least, you know, uh, we we need to respect that aspect of it. You know? Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I apologize. My allergies are kicking up today, so I just need to. Uh, Dab my eye. Sorry, eyes are a little watery. All right, so we might as well get started then. Uh, just a quick check in. Can I'm trying something new today? Can you folks see my slide here? The best and brightest of H5P. Yeah, yes. I see it. Perfect. So um, right from the get go, um, this is one of the interactive types that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, this is called the course presentation. It's uh, very similar to PowerPoint, as you can see, but there are some really cool things that you can do with this course presentation. Um, so as we move through my the presentation portion of this workshop, you'll be able to see um, some of the interactives that you can add into the slides. You'll be able to see what the text looks like and uh, have a couple takeaways from that. And then I'm going to be highlighting a couple other interactives that I have found to be now. They are more complex, the ones that I'm showing you today. But Nimesh, as you said, you want to be inspired. You want to see what's out there. So I've chosen ones that I've really liked um, that I thought really had a lot of um, work put into them. So let's get started. Uh, Holly. Uh, yes. Uh, this presentation itself is H5P, is that right? It is. My this is H5P, yes. And I do have it full screen. If yeah. I didn't have it full screen, this is what it was, this is what it would look like. So one of the questions that I get quite frequently is how can I use H5P interactives in a synchronous workshop? This is a very easy way to do it. Um, have your course presentation. In a, <laughs> in a course presentation. Um, and as you can see, if I navigate back and forth, I have my slides. I can also see my slides down this um, table of contents, if you will. So I can jump back and forth. I also have a bit of a timeline here. Sorry, let's so just talk let, about Let off. me ask you, um, sure. what is the benefit of doing in this instead of PPT? So the benefit is um, really it's embeddable anywhere you can put an iframe in, uh, which is really nice. So if you do want to have a copy in your um, e Conestoga, I know you can do that with a PowerPoint as well, but it can be reused almost anywhere that an iframe can be embedded. So let's say you're wanting to use this and let's say you've created a press book, uh, open textbook and you want to pop your course presentation into it as part of the learning materials. You can do that. Um, Pressbooks allows for that um, embedding of that H5P. You can put it on WordPress. You can put it on a website. Um, so it's that transferability, I think. And you'll also see um, some of the interactives that I've added into the course presentation. Um, if you're looking for that engagement, that um, mixing of media, if you will, um, there's some perks to it as well. And of course, there's always downsides. I'm not going to be showing you these without explaining, you know, they are a little bit more work. Um, 
PowerPoint is very easy. It comes with its templates. You click a button, it does the thing basically. <laughs> with H5P, especially the more complex um, types like this, there is more work involved. And I will show you that as we go through the presentation. Okay, uh, what is iframe? iframe is basically anything you want to embed like a youtube video um a form a um any kind of media like that an audio file anything that you are embedding somewhere else comes in an iframe so i can show you an example if i click on embed you can see how it starts with iframe here mm -hmm. that's just what it's called so that's oh. just the coding behind it yeah oh. okay so i'm gonna pop into and if you are interested i'm going to pop the link for the presentation into the chat as well as the workshop learning record we'll come back to that in just a sec so let me just get back into full screen here so for those of you who don't know me my name is holly and i am uh, out of the library i am the library technologist for e-learning and digital skills so Learning outcomes for today, I hope to show you five different types of H5P interactives um, and help you differentiate between the content types and how they align to different levels of Bloom's taxonomy, just bringing in that pedagogical piece as well. Um, I hope you'll be able to determine a course or a learning goal and how an H5P interactive can help students meet that goal and then get you started creating an H5P interactive that helps students achieve your course or learning goals. And so for a pre-assessment, did you folks get the, um, the, wor the working um, learning record? That uh, document tool? If not, the link is right in the chat. So um, if you don't mind taking a couple minutes to complete the pre-assessment, hopefully it will guide you on um, creating some goals for your H5P learning outcomes. And this is something that you can refer back to and use it to guide any kind of interactive creation that you're doing. And so I'm actually going to bring it up myself. And I chose this, it's a very different kind of pre-assessment. I chose this because it also demonstrates from the learner perspective, another H5P tool, which is called the documentation tool. And so I'll talk more about the documentation tool in just a moment, but this is uh, something that I adapted from Jessalyn Wilkinson, whom I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. And um, what the documentation tool um, is really good for is for guiding um goal oriented tasks maybe reflection based tasks so that's why i chose it as a pre assessment it does take a little bit more work but you can make this as long or as short as you want so i will uh, let Holly, uh, so, sorry to uh, yeah bug you here. this could be a good for any course am i right at the start of oh, the yeah. course of course. You know, I, I uh, let's find out. You know, what is the understanding student have, and what mm -hmm. are their goals? What is the expectation? What they want to achieve with when at the end of this course? Exactly. And so, yeah, you can customize these questions. These are just ones I adapted from Jessalyn, but you can have as many or as few as you want. And oh, there's Nasreen. Hi, Nasreen. Welcome to the workshop. We have somebody else. <laughs> uh, Nasreen, we are just working on a pre-assessment. I'll send you the link if you're interested in taking a look at it. Yes, sure, Holly. I just popped the link into the chat. So Thank basically you. everything I'm using uh, today, Nasreen, is uh, H5P based. <laughs> yes. So um, just explaining the documentation tool. And we're using this as a pre-assessment. Um, just to help shape the goals, the outcomes for the H5P interactive um, that we will hopefully start building a little bit later on. Thank you. So I'll just give folks a couple more minutes to work through that if they haven't done so already.
And I mean, you may not have, you know, three learning, uh, three new things you want to learn, just fill it in to the extent that you're able to. Um, because you can always come back and reuse this. And uh, Nimesh, uh, one more thing that I do like about the documentation tool, just going back to what we were talking about before, is that the learners are able, so you, I can't right now because I didn't fill this in, but at the end, you're able to save your results and export it. So either um, as an instructor, you could have students fill this out and send it to you or just keep it. Um, for their own reflection. Save it as a, I believe it's exported as a word file, I might, or a text file. Um, so it's that nice, uh, they have a takeaway. Thank you, Nasreen, I appreciate that. I will say I did adapt this from Jessalyn's. <laughs> she's done a, she's done a very excellent job using the, uh, the tool here. And that's one thing I like about H5P, very easy to reuse things. I do also like this uh, prioritizing goals. I think this is really handy, especially when folks are given the time to create more than one. <laughs> So it does export in a Word document, just to uh, confirm that. All right, how are we doing? Can I check in with folks and see, uh, do you need a little bit more time? Or are you feeling pretty good? Uh, I need a few more, a couple sure. of minutes. All right, sounds good. Juliet Nasreen, did you have any troubles filling it in or exporting it? No, I'm filling it online. Do I have to export it, Holly? Uh, you don't have to. It's just for your own um, information. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been able just now to um, export it. Perfect. So should it, it came out in a Word document for you as well? Um, no, mine looks like it's, um, it might be a text file. Uh, sorry, I don't know what type it's like on the screen. Um, oh, sorry, I couldn't see that. My thing was blocking it. No problem. Um, so yeah, a Word document. Perfect. Okay. So, um, just for the sake of time, I am going to press on. Nimesh, we can always come back to it if you're not quite finished. So just a little bit of a discussion for a warm up. Um, so it's pretty easy to export your pre-assessment. So once again, this is just for your own information. We can refer back to it a little bit later when we're working on um, our H5P interactives. Uh, did anybody want to share a learning outcome or goal that they hope to have met with an H5P interactive from a course that maybe you're teaching or, or you're developing? Holy cow, could you tell me the question again? Sorry, um, you, you broke up in between. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Can everybody hear me okay? 
All right. Um, so I'm just curious. So I'm hoping everybody's going to be using eight, the H5Ps that we start with today um, as part of a course maybe they're developing or something that they're currently teaching. Um, what is one learning outcome or goal from your course or whatever you might be teaching that you hope to have met with an H5P interactive? I think um, last semester when I was teaching a course and it has been helpful, I, that, that course was hybrid. So I have a one hour synchronous session. So that was very helpful, you know, to achieving that goal. Because what happened instead of giving the managing material, so I had H5P tool included. So every mm -hmm. time students had a chance to do self-assess in a low stake manner without grade associated with that. So I found, you know, it was helpful because uh, people had a chance to kind of self-check. And it was an interesting tool for them in you know, doing some things, something playing around with those. The students liked it, I found. So for me, it kind of created a motivational aspect also. So I think my goal was, you know, getting more involvement into the asynchronous session because it was difficult to get people there. So that yeah. was my goal from the course perspective. Fantastic. Thank you, Nasreen. That's great. And you bring up a good point that I hope everybody is aware of with these H5P interactives is that they're great for that kind of formative assessment, student engagement, um, knowledge checks, self checks. They're not attached to any grade items. Um, let's say if you're using them in Econestoga. Um, so that isn't that is important to note. Um, maybe someday they will be. I know eCampus Ontario with the H5P Studio is working on um, content results, but it's still in beta and it doesn't work the greatest. So that is not something I would rely on if you want to use these as uh, graded items. Did anybody else have any um, learning outcomes or goals or what's one thing you would like to learn in today's workshop? Well, I would just add, um, we're thinking in the library to have um, something interactive. We're not quite sure of all the details, but so that students can learn about evaluating information. So um, often we get feedback that students are using um, poor quality or questionable um, websites. So um, we are looking at developing a H5P component that faculty could assign their students as a kind of extra piece of how to evaluate a source. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love it. Um, and actually, going back to the documentation tool, I think um, if that was built out to guide students through an evaluation process, they would be able to, you know, maybe the professor might use that as part of the assignment, and they could submit this Word document with, uh, and it shows their critical thinking of how they evaluated the, uh, the website, let's say. Uh, really great. Thank you, everyone. So the best and brightest of H5P. Um, I have chosen what I feel the top five interactives are, and they are kind of the um, showstoppers, if you will. These are, as I mentioned at the start, these are much more complex than, say, your multiple choice, your true and false, um, your dialogue cards, stuff like that. They are more complex. They do take more time. But once you are comfortable with them, they're worth it. You can do a lot with these um, interactives. So interactive videos, I think um, most of us, if not all of us, are very familiar with. Um, basically, you have a video and overlaid. Um, the difference with H5P is that you can overlay a multitude of different things. You can have those quiz questions. You can have links if you want to supplement the video with further reading. You can have text pop up. You can have an image pop up. Um, it's that mix and match element that I think really takes the interactive video to the next level with H5P. It, quiz questions are fantastic for those knowledge checks, but it's going above and beyond and really making the video enriched with different kinds of interactives. Course presentations, we already kind of talked about at the start since that's what I'm using for my presentation today. And um, 
Namesh, here's another um, here's another quick um, perk about using the course uh, presentation tool. You can embed questions right into your presentation, um, and you can pull your audience. Let's say, and um, so here's an example of a multiple choice question. How many different H5P content types are there? Feel free to either shout it out or put your number in the chat. Juliet, did you have a question? Yeah, I guess 30 to 40. 30 to 40, okay. Um, and then I also wanted to ask if, <laughs> oh, this was about interactive videos. Sure. If there's a recommend or a best practice of like one question per video or like what's too much? Okay, we'll talk about, can I talk about that in just a couple minutes? Sure. Because it's my next piece actually. Okay, thanks. Now, um, Holly, mm -hmm. now this uh, you put in, uh, now can the student, I mean, I'm not able to click but when you are putting your um, pointer, mm -hmm. then it is you know, changing the you know, slides, but as a student, can they, they are able to click this thing? They would be able to if you shared the link to the presentation. Since I'm sharing my screen, I'm using this in more of a synchronous format. So I'm the only one who would be able to click on the number. But if you were um, maybe asynchronous, let's say, and you had your slides up in Econostoga, they would be able to interact with this question. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this is this is more for asynchronous and not for synchronous. Right. I just wanted to exemplify the um, the different ways that you can use this in a synchronous and asynchronous way as well. So Juliet thinks 30 to 40. No, there's actually now more than 40 different content types. So I have been able to show the solution. How do you choose when there's so many? Yeah, exactly. That's where um, pedagogy has a huge factor in um, in choosing your H5P interactives. Really, uh, I, I'm oversimplifying, but it comes down to what do you want your learner to be able to do? And does it match with your course outcome? Super oversimplification, I realize that. But are you looking for, let's say, just a quick knowledge check? Or do you want your learner to, let's say, recall facts? So that is on Bloom's taxonomy. It's considered a lower order thinking. Or are you looking for a more critical analysis or maybe a demonstration, something like that? That's where maybe um, the documentation tool or the interactive video comes into play. Um, and then it always comes back to those course goals. Uh, Nasreen, did you have a question? Not a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to uh, piggyback to what you have said, that you already have demonstrated how it can be used in the synchronous session, by the mm -hmm. way. I know that um, uh, we, have, uh, we have a few courses in teaching and learning where we have them, you know, and then in the live classes that can be done. Uh, to be honest, you know, in a very low stake manner, for example, that we have done, people can put the answer in the in the chat, mm -hmm. or somebody can raise their hand. And as they say, the way you did, the professor would select the answer, so they would like to see for the right answer. So I think you have demonstrated the synchronous part very nicely here. Thank you. Appreciate that. And then so we've already talked about documentation tool, image hotspots and branching scenarios. So I'm being very cognizant of my time. <laughs> Because I do want to leave a good chunk for the um, hands-on portion. Um, so this is just a reminder. If you are just starting out with H5P, start small. I know I'm talking about all the grandiose, wonderful things that you can do with H5P. But really, if you are just starting out, start small. Start with a simple question of fill in the blanks. Maybe, um, you know, multiple choice, true and false, and build your skills from there. Um, H5P is fairly easy to use, but there are a lot of steps, especially with the more complex examples that I'm showing. Um, so here's just an example of a fill in the blanks. You can leave tips, which is really um, handy if students need some help. So one, what's one popular type of H5P? 
interactive that I just talked about. Video interactive. You got it. And so your students can either fill that in or you can fill it in. And then once again, it's just a check. Everybody loves that little star, the one out of one, <laughs> the gamification. I love it. So yeah, if you're just starting out, don't be afraid to start small. I just want to throw that in there because um, H5P is great, but it can be overwhelming for some folks, myself included. And I've been using this for ages. <laughs> so um, don't be afraid to start small. Okay, interactive videos. Let's get on with the show and tell. So this is a little interactive video that I made. And I really like interactive videos because you can really enrich the content with different kinds of interactives. You can add in different kinds of questions, fill in the blanks, multiple choice. You can do matching. You can do drag and drop. You can do pretty much anything which is really fantastic and the layout is really simple so here's an example i grabbed um, a video about oer from algonquin college and so i just wanted to show you this is what it's going to look like for your students as well you have your player you have your timeline at the bottom anywhere there's one of these little dots it's going to be a question and then, so I have one question, I have a summary activity at the end. And then I also have, which is really nice, you can create little bookmarks. Um, so maybe there's something important that you wanna flag or something like that. You can also have a table of contents for those bookmarks. So you can jump right to that section, for example, we'll just close that. And then, so this is what the multiple choice question looks like. So basically, um, and there is different ways that you can set this up. I have it for an accessibility measure. I have the video stop at the question. So it's not gonna keep playing as the student is taking their time to answer the question. What's really great about this, it's all um, workable with screen readers, uh, keyboard shortcuts, that kind of thing. So um, this is just an example of a multiple choice question. All of the above, you can check. And then once you hit continue, the video keeps playing. And then at the end, you also have a summary activity, which is basically a um, just a quick knowledge check on the whole video. And so you can see I've had this display a little bit differently where this is a button instead of the questions appearing automatically. And then you have, you know, choose your correct statement. Just show you what this looks like really quick. And then once again, you continue, the video finishes, and then you have your score. And then so you can submit answers. I'm not sure where they go because <laughs> this is not attached to any grade item. But um, I really like interactive videos. As I said, they're great for higher order learning like critical analysis, evaluation, um, real life scenarios and demonstrations. They're really great for demonstrations, step-by-step um, -step procedures, that kind of thing. And so I have a couple of other examples. Um, one that I really like is the stone working tool. So this is something I found for the trades. Oh, Nasreen has to leave, okay. <laughs> so it's just back to two of us. Um, so I do have some other examples that you can look through. These are ones that I combed through the, uh, the studio and found that I really liked there they all kind of um, show different uses for the interactive video. So we have a demonstration video with a true or false quiz, self-directed lesson with text and summary activity, and then an educational video with quiz questions embedded. Couple tips for creating those interactive videos, build a plan before you start. This is, um, think of it kind of like a lesson plan. 
um, or a script for when you're creating um, maybe a short tutorial video. Basically, what I like to do is I like to I'll watch my video through a couple of times and then I will um, timestamp where I want something to happen. So maybe if I look back at this video, let me just get to the start. I know I really want to highlight that Creative Commons licensing, so I'm going to put a bookmark there. I know that, you know, it's important for students to know what an OER is, so I'm going to test that knowledge there, maybe with a multiple choice question, or it could be another kind of question. And then since the video is only about two minutes long, I don't want to overwhelm. Whoops, sorry. I don't want to overwhelm with questions. So a good rule of thumb, I would say if it's a shorter video, maybe two sets of questions. There's no hard and fast, like for every two minutes, you should have two questions or something like that. I think it really depends on the video and how much you want your learners to do the check-ins. Um, because if there's too many, students will just bypass them and they won't bother doing them. So I find um, a sweet spot is maybe one to two um, for a shorter video. And I mean, that could go up to five minutes. If it's longer um, and you have your video maybe chunked out, maybe something after every, let's call it chapter or um, chunk of information. But once again, that can be very tedious. So I would switch up the question types for student engagement and to keep it interesting. Juliet, I hope that helps. I know it's not a hard and fast, but um, thank you. That's a good guidance. Yeah, it, it's really subjective, to be honest. <clears throat> and then um, we've talked about course presentation at length, so I'm not going to go too deep into this. Um, Nimesh, I hope I've answered your questions about the um, the perks of using a course presentation. I, I think the the way it looks like that uh, this is a good tool for asynchronous yeah. than the synchronous. Yeah, so synchronous, it really uh, is. Synchronous, the PPT might still be uh, okay, uh, but for the asynchronous activity, this might be a good way to you know uh, work around that one. Yeah, I really like it, especially if you want to use a lot of H5P and you wanna package it all together, it's a really great way to do that. Um, the Some tips that I do have with it is that if you are trying to convert an existing PowerPoint presentation, it's important to note that you cannot just um, import them into the course presentation. You can probably tell from the looks of my slides that so I basically took a slide from an old presentation, exported it as an image, and then added it to the slide. That is the only way that you can import existing slides, unfortunately. Um, don't get bogged down with adding media as well, because the more media that you add, um, the longer it's going to take your presentation to load. So I have a lot of media in this. I have the interactive video, which I embedded, I have quiz questions, images, etc. So um, if you're looking um, at low bandwidth teaching, especially online, don't get bogged down with adding a lot of media. Something to take into consider, even if they are being like a YouTube video that's hosted somewhere else, it's still uh, going to take a lot of bandwidth, the more media you have. And as I like to say, don't forget to consider the learning outcome or goal for your interactive and any interactions you may add to your course presentation. We've also talked about the documentation tool at length. We've experienced it already. Um, I will definitely be using this a lot more in um, the interactives that I create just because I think it's a lot more versatile than one might think. It's um, it's also really great for if you have um, students in your class doing a group project, use it as kind of like a project charter. Who's going to do what? What are you all agreeing to? Export it and have everybody sign off on it. 
So it's a really great tool to foster those other skills, um, not, to, not just learning, but you know, that, those group work skills, um, a little bit of project management, uh, that kind of thing as well. And everybody loves things that they can download and save for their records. So uh, that's another perk of using the documentation tool. Um, once again, a couple tips for the documentations tool. Um, consider the purpose. I say that with every interactive. Will your students use it to take guided notes, plan a project, do group work, et cetera? Don't, provide, don't forget to provide clear instructions within the document tool to help guide students to make the most of the interactive. I've seen some documentation tools where the instructions weren't really great. So students get, didn't get a lot out of it because they weren't exactly sure why they were using it or how they were using it. So just make sure you're providing those clear instructions. Um, I am going to show Kyle's, um, Kyle Mackey is somebody I've met a couple times through conferences. He's an expert when it comes to H5P. And I wanted to show, um, he's created a mini module called, Are You Ready to Teach Online? And it's a combination of interactive video course presentation and documentation tool, but it's done in a really interesting way. So I'm gonna flip to, my other browser for just a second. Bear with me here. And we will go. So this is something that Kyle has made for Algoma University. And so it's, it's a mini module and it's all H5P interactives. And what I really like about it is that the documentation uh, tool goes along with the course presentation in this case, and it's guiding the user on um, taking effective notes as they work through the course presentation. So as you can see, there's those instructions, use the side menu or bottom arrows to navigate the different sections. So um, it's, it's guided note taking, which I think can be very, very beneficial, especially for students who may be new to effective note taking. I think giving that guidance can really help them develop those skills to be effective note takers and help further develop their learning, kind of like guiding them on maybe the key things they should be looking for or note down. And so you can see that this goes in, um, goes right along with the course presentation, which is really nice. Um, there's another example of an embedded video within the course presentation. And then course planning and design, he's done a very similar um, note taking and reflection piece in this case. So for example, who are your learners? What's your course context, et cetera. And, you know, it's for H5P interactives, but it's a mini module. And I think it's, this is just a really um, interesting way. And I'll put this in the uh, chat if you are interested in checking out more of his work. It's all H5P interactives and they're reusable as well. So I am just being cognizant of our time and I'm gonna flip back to my other present, my presentation. Image hotspots is the next one. I love, I'm a visual learner, so I love image hotspots. And basically what it does, it creates an overlay of hotspots, which are clickable and, um, uh, provide more information to the image that they are on top of. Once again, it's great for that in-depth learning, drawing connections among ideas and concepts by highlighting points of interest within an image and adding text or media. A um, couple ways that this could be used, could be used as a self-introduction, a tour of a shop or lab space, which I think is a really neat way to use this. You take a photo of your shop and then pinpoint points of interest and give more information in the hotspot. Um, or as an activity to maybe identify errors with something or correct something. It's great also if you are looking to 
create it even an infographic and make it interactive. There's tons of uses for this. And so um, I just wanted to show the, um, so this is one that one of our uh, writing um, folks did, um, Anne Vermaiden. Can everybody see my screen again? Does it show the body paragraph? Yeah, I see it. Perfect. <laughs> So what Anne has done here, she is helping students learn about effective writing techniques, um, essay writing. And so she has created an interactive breaking down the parts of a paragraph. So she, um, the text is actually saved as an image. Let me see if I can put this full screen. That might make it a little bit easier. And then, so, um, and she came to me asking about how to do this because highlighting was not enough um, and it was not accessible. So we decided on the image hotspot. So you have your topic sentence, the main idea of the paragraph. And so the, the plus um, corresponds with the yellow highlighting. Next, they have your evidence, which is the main support, the material supporting the claim or the idea. Um, if I go down a little bit further, we have additional analysis, your explanation of how evidence supports the topic sentence, and then concluding sentence. And um, from what I can tell from Anne's feedback, this has been a very effective tool for her clients that she um, works with. It's just a very visual way of learning the structure of a paragraph and effective writing techniques, which I think is a really interesting use of this tool. We were thinking of using it like because <clears throat> sometimes students don't know the parts of a source. So like yep. what's the title? Who's the author? Mm -hmm. What's the date? We're trying to think of ways we might use it for that's that. A, that's a fantastic way of doing it, Juliet. And then just making sure that you're adding a little bit of contextual information as well. Like why is this important to highlight? Um, you know, it's part of your APA citation or something like that. I think um, that would be a really great way to do that. So tips for hotspots, making sure that you're using a high resolution image. If it's a small image, related and it won't be accessible. So choose the highest resolution of the image um, as possible. You can use a, a mix of text and other media, so videos. Um, and images for those hotspots. So it doesn't just have to be text. Um, and consider choosing a high contrast color for those image hotspot icons so they are easy to see and detect. So, um, you know, black on a white background or something like that, something that really makes it stand out for um, users, especially if they may be, um, they may have visual impairment or something like that. And then finally, the most complicated one of all, according to me, because I have struggled with this one, is the branching scenario. Basically, what a branching scenario is, it's a kind of, a, if you're familiar with the books, the choose your own adventure style, it allows learners to make decisions and realize the impact of those choices. Um, this allows for the application of ideas and concepts. What I really like about the branching scenario, you can make it as simple or as complex as you like. You're also able to um, use a variety of media as well. So once again, videos, text, images, um, you can throw in some image hotspots, you can throw in question types, um, and the different kinds of the simpler H5P interactives can be built into this as well. And uh, you may use a branching scenario um, in scenario-based simulations, and I'll show you one in just a, just a minute. Um, you know, something like a what would happen if XYZ activity um, and those kinds of um, situations, real life situations, I guess you could call them. And so um, I have a couple of examples here. If you're familiar with Kim Carter from the School of Business, she created simulations uh, to accompany her latest OER therapeutic communication. 
And what those game simulations do is that they teach therapeutic communication skills in real world scenarios. Um, there's also a can I use this image, which is a tool that teaches about image copyrights. And then some tips for those branching scenarios. As I said, this is the most complex one. I would suggest planning out your decision making tree first, whether that's mapping it out on paper or maybe you use Visio for a flow chart or something like that. Plan it out on paper first, because if you just dive right into the branching scenario, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds. Um, so write it out on paper first or however you want to do a mock up, if you will, and then go in and design it in the tool. List all the media you want to use, including the different question types, including the different H5Ps you want to embed within it, um, and indicate those on your decision-making plan. And of course, make it challenging and use a real-world scenario. Um, and add in a couple of reflection pieces so students can think about the choices they made and why this made have, might have happened, for example. What made you choose um, this wrong decision or incorrect uh, decision over this other one? Um, add in those uh, real world scenarios, add in those reflection pieces just to get uh, the critical analysis and the higher order thinking skills. Okay, so a lot of information five different complex interactive types. Um, are there any questions at this time about any of the types that I have shown you through my show and tell? Um, I've been in a situation where I get started making one and I get stuck. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, like videos or tutorials that you recommend like I've watched the one that they put at the top that it says like the tutorial and the example mm -hmm. but <clears throat> are there any additional sources you would suggest you can find some YouTube videos um, from different institutions that have used the H5P eCampus has a few as well, I think, but those tutorials that you're talking about, Juliet, um, are usually my go-to. If you scroll further down, they do um, a step-by-step -step walkthrough. Um, I'm not sure if you've, if you've seen those or not. It is text-based, unfortunately, not video-based, but I would check YouTube. That's a really good question, though. Um, I can dig around and I can... Um, because I don't believe there's much on LinkedIn learning. I think there might be a couple, but um, they're a little bit more high level, I think. So I'm going to put that in my little parking lot, Juliet. Um, and I'm going to see what I can find. And I can send that out in the, uh, the follow-up email in a couple days, if that's oh, okay. That Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Nimesh, did you have any questions about any of the content types that we that we just looked at? Or would you like me to, to show you a couple more or? I'm fine with the, whatever you have shown until now. Okay. Um, maybe uh, we will have to uh, start using it. Uh, uh, yes, uh, exactly. Maybe if it is okay with you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can show us the, you know, the documentation tool because yeah. that's very simple, easy, and mm -hmm. can be used for some uh, without scoring, you know, some assignment, yeah. you know, just to check it out. Sure. Juliet, how do you feel about the documentation tool? Does that work for you? Like I can do a walkthrough or? Yeah, that's, I haven't had exposure okay. to that one. So that's sure. completely new. All right. Um, did we, did you folks want to take a quick break before we get into that? Or do you want me just to keep going through? Uh, let's have a break. Okay. Why don't we take a five minute break and come back at 2 p.m.? Okay. 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 I'll be here if you want to stay, but I might just take a sip of my water. But <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, if you need to take a quick break, step away, stretch your legs, 
that is fine. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, it is two o'clock. Um, are we back? And I just get a thumbs up if you are back. It is two o'clock. Hi, Nimesh. We're back. Hi. Yeah. I think 
Juliet, are you back? Don't think Juliet's quite back yet. Give it another minute here. Hello. Hi. Um, until the Julia comes back, mm. maybe you can, you know, uh, just um, there. Uh, I can see, you know, uh, on your this listing, there are different type of licenses are there. Mm -hmm. uh, do we need to really bother about this thing or not? Um, you do. Well, it depends on how you want to use H5P. Um, the H5P Studio was created to make uh, things reusable, as you said at the beginning of the workshop, Nimesh, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, when it comes to licensing, it is a good idea to assign a license to your work to tell other people how they can use it if you want it reused. If you don't want it reused, then you can either keep it as a work in progress and keep it hidden from the catalog or use an all rights reserved. Um, but when you are using, when you are adding a license, it, you know, you are a creator of a work. So you can tell people how you want them to use that work. I hope that kind of answers your question. Now you're, um... Let's say this workshop learning record. Hmm? Pardon me? Uh, workshop learning record. Learning uh, record? That is yeah. my, that is the pre-assessment that we did. Yeah. Uh, so if suppose I want to, you know, use them. Yeah. Uh, with some uh, change. Mm -hmm. or, or basically I, I want to convert that into uh, the uh, team contract. Sure. Okay. Uh, what do I need to manage? Uh, if I convert it, mm -hmm. then uh, does I need to bother about the, whose license it was or anything earlier? You do. So if you were to use mine, I have it licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial share alike license, which is kind of complicated sounding. But basically, as long as you say I was the originator, I, you know, I I created the one that you're using. Uh, you're not using it to make money for any reason, and you're going to use the same license on yours as you did mine. Then you're free to adapt it and reuse it. That's why it's important. These licenses tell um, people who want to reuse the content how it can be reused. Okay. If you're creating one from scratch, uh, which I will show you how to do really quickly here, um, you can add your own license to it. So if, um, if you do want to start creating one on your own, if you can log into the H5P studio, put the link in the chat, or if you just wanna watch, totally fine too, I leave it up to you. Under create, we are going to choose documentation tool. So a form wizard with a text export. We're just gonna click on that. And then as people are getting to that stage, I'm just gonna fill in the metadata because it won't let me do anything else until I do. So let's call this maybe team plan. Uh, uh, sure. Technology and engineering. <laughs> Testing the documentation tool. You can add keywords. If you're working on this with somebody, you can add contributors. Um, don't worry about the Ontario Commons license. And we'll just keep it a work in progress for now. And then we're going to come over here. If you need an example or the tutorial, 
There are the links and they're in every content type. And then before I even start with the title for my interactive, this um, Nimesh is where you can assign a license. So if you click on metadata, you're going to fill in the form. So the title of your interactive. Uh, since I am making this from scratch, I'm not adapting from anything or anyone. I can choose my own license. In this case, maybe just CC BY. So people, if they reuse it, they can say, oh, Holly made this. I made these changes. Uh, I, typ I typically leave it at the most recent version. I made this in 2022. I don't have an original source. I am the author. And then that's all I need to add. If you were adapting this, I always like to say how it was adapted. So maybe changed question, you know, changed question to, to ABC, whatever. Um, you can also note things in a change log. Uh, it just helps keep track of different changes and it will carry along with the interactive. But since I'm creating this from scratch, we'll keep things fairly simple. So Save. Holly, when nope. you say it'll carry along, so like if someone copies it, they'll see all of those notes? They should. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, no problem. So then I have my title. I'm just calling it team plan. Um, you can change the heading documentation tool if you want. And then the elements are those individual pages, the different questions that we went through in the pre-assessment. So basically, um, if you want more than one question or page, as they're called, you would just add a page. But let's do our first one. So um, it's limited on what you can do. You can have a standard page, the goals page, the goals assessment page, or the document export page. The document export page should always go at the end. If you have it at the start, it may be a little confusing. So maybe let's start with the standard page. And then as you can see, the elements will fill in depending on the page type that you select. If it's the goals page, a few less. You're basically just describing the goals um, or the guiding information for the student to develop the goals. But let's stick with the standard page for now. Or you can do whatever you like if you're working on your own. You can see there's metadata for everything. You don't necessarily need to put your metadata in every single thing. But let's um, call this group members, let's say. And then your element type. It can be an image, text input, field editor, element, or text. I'm just going to keep it text. And then label for help text. Um, if you want to give them more guidance, that's where you would put this in. List your group members here. And then that's that. You can add more elements if you want. I don't think there's much help needed for that. Those are pretty clear instructions. Do not hit save yet. If you hit save, it will save the entire activity. Um, if you want to add a page, you just keep adding pages because it will save um, throughout. But if you're worried about losing your information, hit save. But then you have to go back in and edit things as you go. So then so maybe... Holly, can you help me understand? So it's like mm -hmm. the, doc the, the documentation is like the container and then these elements are the pieces in the documentation. Exactly. Yeah. So, so why, why don't I save this and I'll show you what it looks like. So you could save an empty documentation and then it could be empty and it, you'd still yeah. save it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is where, so this is just the text and with one page because mm. I haven't added anything else yet. So then you can go back in and edit. 
like you said, if you wanted just to save the container, you could always go back and edit and then go back. And maybe we want to add an element, the text input field. So this would give us, instead of just text, this would be a box where they could add their own text. And then um, you can say maximum of 10 lines and you can choose to make it required or not before they proceed to the next one. So if I save that, So now you can see we still only have the one page, but there's my text element and then there's my text input field. So then a student would be able to enter their group members, for example. So then if I add a page, maybe we could do a goals page. Pro maybe we call this project outcomes. Give some instructions, list the top three outcomes you hope to achieve for this project. And you do have to pay attention to um, what they're asking. This is why I say it's a little more complex because there's a lot of information to fill in. So then we have create new goal. You can leave this placeholder text if you want, or you can change it. I'm just gonna leave it, just keeping an eye on our time here. And then if I save it, I'll show you what that looks like now. And you don't have to have these goal pages. You can just have all the standard pages if you want. It's really flexible. And so in the pre-assessment, this is where those goals come into play. So make a working prototype. Gather feedback on prototype. Great documentation. I'm just, you know, making up some goals here. But since we don't have the goal assessment or the export built in, nothing can be exported yet. So if we add a page, once again, we can do that goal assessment page. You can um, fill in the, um, the text if you want to. Text for worst rating. Maybe we just wanna say third, <laughs> second, first outcome since we're not really rating anything. And then let's add in our export document export page. Once again, you can fill in the placeholder text if you want to. So I'm just saying ensure each group member has a copy. I'm pretty happy with the other labels. And then, like I said, you can add probably as many pages as you want to. I'm keeping this simple just for the sake of time. And then you can do some further overrides if you need anything translated. This is where um, there's not much to do since mine is fairly simple, but you would be able to change the text on some of the buttons that get displayed. Um, 
I typically leave those alone. I'm fairly happy with the language that's used. But if you're doing something and maybe the, the buttons don't really match, you can customize that text. And then um, you have your behaviors down at the bottom here. Um, Nimesh, if, for example, if you don't want people to download your content or reuse it, you can turn these off. I suggest leaving the copyright button on uh, no matter what license you're using. Um, but if you don't want people to embed or download, you can turn those off. Uh, I do typically leave the display buttons on. And then once you're happy, click save. And unfortunately, there isn't a preview function. Your save is your preview. OK, um, can I ask, uh, can the student use as a group project this kind of a documentation, or this has to be used individually? Um, if it's for a group project, like, do you want them to create the document tool or just fill out the document? Fill out the document. For example, I, the team charter is yeah. a group project, am I right? So yes. everybody yeah. has to, you know, give their inputs and the type mm -hmm. in. Okay, so before they make it final, let's say somebody started typing in, yeah. and everybody reviews that document uh, online, and then, you know, uh, everybody agrees, then, you know, submit. So how, how that is possible? Basically, um, one person from the group could fill it out with everybody's input, or you could have, have it somehow that um, individuals fill it out, but then you might get some different answers. So I think one person from the group has to fill it out. It's not really collaborative in that nature. Um, and there's no real, you know, um, they can't save and continue to come back to it later either. Uh, it, it does not have that one drive type of a functionality, basically. Not as, not like a, no, that's a good point. No, not really, unfortunately. Okay. Because yeah. I, I, I was thinking of this as a, a good tool for one another course, which I taught last mm -hmm. semester, which they were using a lot of templates. Now, yes. right now, all those templates are as a Word file. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, um, what is the advantage of using this over, you know, Word template? Um, I could see once again, um, well, I mean, there's no distinct advantage unless somebody maybe doesn't have Word, but all of your students should have access to Word. So <laughs> um, that's not really an advantage. Um, this can be, it's the embeddability, I think again, um, but it's not a collaborative document. So that is a that is a fault, unfortunately. I think it's the portability of it, the embeddability, um, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. The, the only thing we know when I, uh, only aspect what I liked about this one, I, I'm gonna maybe it's possible in Word. I have not never tried it out. Mm -hmm. is, uh, <clears throat> again, you know, for individual project, yes, you can use this one very easily, the mm -hmm. same way you use the Word file. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the the one benefit you can get here, which I'm not sure how how much you can get. You you maybe you, you basically this is some similar to a form, more or less. Exactly. Uh, in the form also you can basically say that uh, this is a must uh, area that everybody has mm -hmm. to fill in something without before moving into with, before they can save it. Yes, and you yeah. can do that here as well. Yeah. So as you can see. Um, it is required, so you can jump to other sections, but before it allows you to export, you have to go back and fill that information in. Yeah, and that is yeah. always also available in the forms also. So it's it a, is. It, this is a yeah. basically similar to the forms uh, yeah. in some sense. It is, very much so, yeah. The only, only thing which, uh, you know, on the left-hand side, you know, that kind of a structure, what is available, 
uh, that is something uh, not available or I have never seen it being used in a word file or in a form. No, uh, I haven't is, either. So, so yeah, that is a nice perk, the um, the visual layout of it, the navigation. Yeah, so that's the only you know major difference I can see. Otherwise, uh, I've not seen in our context, uh, especially when the student has 365 mm -hmm. to use this kind of thing. Okay, but that's uh, good to know this kind of tool is available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you can use it in different ways as well. Maybe it won't work for the team charter that you're trying to build, but there are very, there's a lot of different uses for it for like guided note taking, as I mentioned, and stuff like that as well. Um, so that's a really quick introduction on how to create a document tool. Um, we're coming to the end of the workshop. Uh, any questions on on the documentation tool? Um, I realize that was a little quick, but um, it's one of the less complex ones out of the ones that I decided to highlight today. Um, Juliet, did you have any questions on? No, thank you. That was helpful. I'd not yeah. seen that um, documentation tool before. Yeah, I really, <clears throat> I really like it. It's something I'm going to be using a lot more. I think. Um, so if we're good, I might flip back and just, I have a couple more slides if that's all right. Um, I, I, if it is okay, if you have a little mm -hmm. time, I just want a quick, um, because what I found this is very really useful in, you know, like embedding, uh, questions in the videos Yeah. or, or I mean, there are more things you had suggested, but a very simple thing, you know, just because any video which is more than uh, 20 minutes, um, more than 10 minutes long, we should mm -hmm. break it down to around 10 oh, minutes. Yeah. That's what is my understanding. So yeah, uh, I wanted to break them down and, you know, put the videos uh, after every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, how easy uh, to do those things? I can show you one that I've made if you like Nimesh. Um, Juliet, does that work with you as well? Sure. Yeah, okay. a, a very quick, uh, just, you know, yeah. just, uh, we can, you know, quickly see it. So this is the one that I do have embedded in my course presentation. If H5P Studio decides to work, <laughs> I'm just gonna pop right into edit. So basically it lays out, um, you start with uploading your video and then you add your interactions. And I really like this because it kind of gives you a preview of how it's going to look. So let's say we want to add something at this Creative Commons. Um, doo -doo -doo, sorry, got to slide it along here. So maybe after our Creative Commons section, think it ends. Yeah, right there. So you slide your um, slide your player onto your timeline there. And then choose the type that you want to add. So let's say, um, maybe I want to do true or false. So you can either have it as a poster, which shows the questions, or the button, which you click on the button, and then it pops up the questions. So let's do it as a poster. I'm gonna pause my video so it doesn't go while the question's being answered. Give it a title. You can add more media if you want. Um, sorry, it's true or false, so let's make this a statement. Correct answer is true. You can, um, you know, add your retry and all of that. And then hit done. And then you might just need to move around the question pop up and just maximize it a bit so everything is shown. 
And then you can see on my timeline that I have another circle and that's where that true or false pops up. Okay, so that's yeah, really so, all there is to it. Yeah, so it's not very difficult. No, no uh, it's not. If, if you are starting this from scratch though, I do suggest making a bit of a plan. Watch your video a couple times and then at the timestamp, like two minutes, 36 seconds, just mark what kind of interactive you want because it's really easy to get bogged down in this um, and it can take a lot more time than necessary. I always like to start with the plan. That way I keep myself on track rather than, ooh, this looks neat or, oh, that looks cool and really getting lost in the weeds. Okay, now, uh, yeah. now once I have saved this video, mm -hmm. so basically I have uploaded, let's say from YouTube or from any other video, so it's uploaded, I created it, this one, then I can export this one, am I right? Or I can, you know, uh, how do I share with the students? Mm -hmm. So you can either send them this link, the URL here at the top, or this is where that iframe, the embed comes into play. So this works in um, eCampus on, sorry, Econistoga. You just copy this in. And I actually do have a slide in the course presentation that I'll share with you that has the steps on how to embed it into um, your course if you want to put it into D2L. Okay. And, yeah. And this can be... Um... Whether it's a D2L or whether uh, or uh, it can be uh, given to anybody, am I right? This link can be given to anybody. Yeah, exactly. There's no uh, password on it or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, we do have three minutes left, so not a lot of time. Um, I am going to end things there. I just want to say thank you both for joining me for the workshop today. If you have follow up questions, please feel free to reach out. I'll put my email into the chat. And I can help you if it's troubleshooting technical things, if it's trying to choose what interactive to use. Um, I can help you out with all of that. Teaching and learning also has some really great resources for um, more of the pedagogical aspects of H5P. And um, I will send everybody the slides and um, tutorial videos, Juliet, I will remember to send those along as well and um, the recording for this as well. So everything in a nice little package in the next couple of days. Okay. Thanks, no Holly. Nice. You're very welcome. Nice Thank to you meet much, you, Holly. Namesh. Thank you. <laughs> yes, nice to meet you, Namesh. Have no a great bye. day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.